Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're about to get started. If I could ask everybody to take their seats. Time's money. Big, got a big program today, and uh, and we would like to uh, we'd like to get started. I'd like to thank you all for uh, getting up early. Um, not many people look like they're nursing hangovers, so it was a pretty tame evening, it looks like. Um, thank you for, uh, for coming to this panel, and thank you for coming to Ukraine Invest's Invest Day. Uh, we have the whole day today um, because we think it's important that, as the government's investment promotion agency, that we're not just pitching investors on the opportunities of Ukraine, of which there are many, many. And, what we really want to accomplish today, through the whole day, and we're starting out, we have a great panel to start off with this morning, is that we want to put Ukraine in the context of global trends and some of the major things that are happening in the world today, and including its contribution to those kinds, to those efforts in all of the different areas that we're going to explore today. And I'd like to uh, thank the members of the panel for, uh, for agreeing to do this. We'll introduce them in a second. Um, I'd like to thank TIU Canada for sponsoring this. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. And uh, uh, what we will try to do today is to try to put Ukraine's renewable energy sector in the context of a broader uh, issue of climate change in the world today. And, you know, from, in, from 1880 to, uh, to 2012, uh, the average global temperature increase, as I understand, is a, has been about less than one uh, degree of Celsius. And uh, at the same time, that is rapidly increasing. We've had in 19, in the last hundred years, uh, we've had the, the, globe, the oceans of the world rise by 19 centimeters. So something, something is seriously going on. And uh, the, what we have, we have a panel today of, uh, of eminent business people. I, deliberately structured this panel uh, not to have uh, uh, representatives of the Ukrainian government. They'll have some, something to hopefully uh, uh, add uh, at the end. But I wanted uh, to hear from business, and I wanted to hear from our neighbors uh, in, uh, in, in the European Union, in the European community, about what they think is happening in, uh, in Ukraine and what is happening globally and how Ukraine fits into that global context. We're very happy to have Yanis Kopach, who is the director of the Uni European uh, Energy Community Secretariat, an organization that has been instrumental in helping Ukraine harmonize its legislation uh, with the EU. Uh, we have at the, in the sort of second from the, uh, the left, David Korchia, CEO of Total uh, Aaron, uh, Total Aaron, and uh, that's an interest. We'll hear all about what a, one of the world's largest oil and gas companies are doing owning a renewable energy company. And I'm sure he'll be uh, more than happy to tell us about that. We have the glamorous and famous Carl Sturen, uh, Sweden's honorary consul uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. But his real day job is as the founder and CEO of uh, Windcraft, one of the uh, most uh, progressive uh, uh, wind power companies in Ukraine. And our uh, representative, our sponsor, Michael uh, Yurkovich, the CEO of TIU Canada which again started in the gas sector and uh, in the energy sector in Canada and North America and has found uh, opportunity in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, gentlemen, and, and I just, just for the record, they're all gentlemen. Usually we've really tried to have gender balance. I did offer the first position to Fabienne from Total Erin, who gave up her position to her CEO. I don't understand what the internal politics of that was. You guys can sort it out. But, but I just wanted, I, no, no, we'll get her at the end. But I, I just wanted to put that, uh, put that out there, put that on the record, because uh, I was getting uh, uh, some sharp glances to our, from our all-female organizing committee. Um, it's, it's interesting that uh, every year the, the World Economic Forum does uh, a survey of, its, uh, of, of the people that it's invited corporate leaders uh, especially, to rank what are uh, the things that concern them the most uh, this year. And this year, uh, it, was, it was very, very interesting that three of the five risks deemed most likely to materialize in 2019 
uh, was uh, the impact that climate change is having on the world and the climate change is having on, on business. And what is interesting is that 10 years ago, climate change was not even on the list. People were worried about the financial crisis, they were working about uh, uh, where things were going with other economic issues. Um, and so how the world's changed in 10 years is, is quite, uh, quite, quite dramatic. And even last week, we had the uh, statement that was issued by the former uh, governors of the Federal Reserve in the United States. You know, I mean, they're the ultimate uh, uh, arbiters of what goes on with the f uh, money in the world, saying that climate change was the thing that really worried them the most. Some of that might be driven by the domestic agenda in the United States, but the, as we all know, the domestic agenda in the United States pretty much drives the rest of uh, the world. Uh, as one uh, person said to me, uh, that uh, who's an American, uh, that um, you know, I s somebody asked her, is uh, is the uh, you know is the world going to is the United States going to survive uh, the, uh, uh, the the current administration? Said the United States will. We're not sure about the rest of the world. <laughs> and so, in in this context, uh, Yanis, I would I would like to start with you. Um, Maybe you could just very briefly describe what the European uh, Energy Secretariat, uh, uh, Community Secretariat is, um, because it has a very unique function and has been very, very instrumental in helping uh, harmonize, the, uh, having countries in, uh, in that, are, that are close to the EU that would like to join the EU, that have joined the EU, actually all start singing from the same hymn book. Maybe you could give us a very, very brief analysis of that and, and some of your thoughts on uh, how, the, how uh, your work impacts on this issue of climate change. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me first. Uh, energy community established some 12, 13 years ago was, a tri uh, was an attempt to copy European Union's approach of regional cooperation. So we have European Union as a member and then nine other member states. One of them is Ukraine, the biggest one. Uh, apart from EU and the energy community is uh, mostly copy-pasting energy-related uh, legal framework a key into other non-EU members but members of energy community. And this is um, uh, in uh, Ukraine joint in 2011 and I have to say that uh, it was a decisive moment for Ukraine because when it joined energy community somehow uh, was incompatible with Euro-Asian Economic Union. And uh, this was a formal reason because uh, uh, at that time, uh, Prime Minister Medvedev uh, formally asked Ukraine to step out of energy community to be formally able to enter Euro-Asian Economic Union. And you know what happened with Maidan. Um, so uh, uh, Ukraine decided to go into, into this European direction back in 2011. Um, in first uh, three years, not much happened, but after Maidan, uh, there was a, a, a hunger for reforms. And uh, uh, I remember one of my colleagues said during Maidan, Let, let's go to Kiev, let's protest together with um, Ukrainians. And then uh, another colleague said, no, look, we are an organization based on the rule of law. Let's draft them a law. Um, and we did, uh, electricity market law and gas market law. And you won't believe this gas market law, which we drafted as a template law, was a few months later adopted. And this was the first big reform in Euro uh, Ukrainian energy sector. Just, just to interfere, for those of you who know anything about Ukraine, a few months from start to finish to get a law <laughs> through parliament is warp speed. <laughs> yeah, th that was really a miracle. And uh, it, it moved, it really changed the uh, energy sector. Uh, with electricity market law, it was a little bit harder, but uh, Mr. Dombrowski here, uh, chairing committee for energy in, in Rada, Verkhovna Rada, was a person who pushed it through, not government, but one of the members of the parliament. And uh, now, currently, at this moment, uh, we assisted in drafting new renewables support law, uh, which basis is based on, again, European practice of auctions which are compliant with state aid rules and uh, the law passed the first reading it is compliant with european acquis and hopefully it will pass second reading in end february march uh, and then this will be a new era for uh, um, 
investment fr um, environment into renewables in Ukraine. And I very much look forward uh, on these future developments. Well, th thank you very much, Yanis. You've uh, picked up on some, uh, some key themes that I, uh, I think we will develop uh, over the course of the next hour. Uh, but David, I'd like to uh, come over to you. You're the, uh, the new kid on the block, and you'll, you'll tell us about that. Uh, you're the big new kid on the block. Um, uh, first uh, major French energy com uh, uh, company to, to now uh, set, uh, set its stake in Ukraine. But where, just expanding this, where do you see, um, uh, how do you see renewables actually helping with the climate change? I mean, how much impact can the, uh, the issue of renewable energy actually have? And what is the business case for actually pursuing it? Um, okay, the first thing I think you, you said that all the CEOs do agree now that there is a big issue, which is climate change. I'm going to tell you what a good friend of mine told me couple, some time ago. Uh, he told me, we got it wrong. We should not call it a climate change. Because that's precisely the issue. The issue is that the name came from climate experts who are more, you know, studying about science. And so they wanted to say something which is, Climate change is definitely the wrong name. We should call it the climate crisis. We don't call it a financial change or social change. You know, people are used to have crisis everywhere, and we are really in a climate crisis. So I think I'm happy to see that the CEOs of the world think now that climate change is an issue. I think it's not an issue. It's a real crisis. But So that's the bad news. But the good news is that we have the solutions. Uh, we have the solutions, um, and the renewable energy is one, probably the main solution. And I'm going to tell you why we have the solutions. We have the solutions because some people, especially Germany, so as I said to my team, uh, we have to thank Germany every morning when we wake up, uh, because some people in it's Europe... It's very hard for the French. Yeah, but, but we have to. So it's, uh, it's in Europe and in the US to a lesser extent um, that basically some people decided a long time ago that they would spend a lot of money, a lot of subsidies, billions, tens of billions of euros, or even for Germany, 100 billions of euros to subsidize this, this industry. Because this industry was not performing, this industry was not big enough, this industry was not delivering the equipment that we needed. And so in the 90s and the first decade of the, the, the 2000s, um, basically, all of these guys decided to put a ton of money, and it's really a ton of money. You know, I remember when we were doing renewable energy, at the time I was the CEO of EDF Energy Nouvelle, um, and we were building a lot of renewable energy assets, all of that with very big subsidies and very high tariffs. But the good news is that what they did was to make the industry significantly, significantly bigger and significantly better. And what it means is that now, thanks to this effort that people are paying still today in Germany, in France, and in other countries, or in Spain, um, now we have equipment, whether it's wind machines, or we have equipment, whether it's solar panels, that are really cheap, that generate much more energy than what we used to do in the 90s or in the first years uh, of 2000s. Um, and basically, so it means that we can bring electricity at a, at, a, at a price, at a cost, that makes sense to the people. So that's... That's the aspect, you know, the aspect is that it's not a climate change, it's a climate crisis, but the good news is that we managed to find the, solu we managed to find the solutions. So the issue now was, uh, you know, and just uh, a few words on, on, uh, on our background. Um, um, at some point, you know, we, I was the CEO of EDF Energy Nouvelle, we, take, we took the company public, we had a lot of funds, we built a lot of thousands of megawatts, and at some point EDF, the big French utility company said, I want to own 100% to own of this company. So I'm going to make a takeover of the company. It's going to be a friendly takeover. And they did a friendly takeover. Uh, so with, uh, with our partner, the founder of EDF Energy Nouvelle, Paris Moratoglou, we said, what are we, going to, what are we going to do now? And now we are going to change the model. So we created Eren. It was not Total Eren at the time uh, in 2012. And we said, you know what we are going to do now? We are going to focus on the countries that have a lot of wind, a lot of sun, and where, thanks to the effort that was made in Europe, uh, in the EU, and especially in Germany, we are going to, ha to use equipments that are really performing well now in those regions that are, I, called, I call them the blessed regions in the world, 
with a lot of wind, with a lot of sun, and where we can generate electricity at a price that makes sense to the people. So it means that we have the good combination. You know, as I said, we are in a crisis, but we have the equipments, and now countries, and we are developing in Latin America, in Asia, and you know, we'll come back on that if you want, and now in Ukraine, and as I told our team when they came for the first time from Ukraine saying, there is a big project with our friend at NBT uh, that we want to do. I said, okay, let's go because it's one of the blessed countries with a lot of wind where we can generate electricity at, uh, at a cost that makes sense. Do you find in the countries that you're operating in that, um, I mean, are you price competitive at every level or is it, is it something that you're slightly more expensive but people are starting to understand that this is a climate crisis and they're prepared to pay a little bit more to be good consumers and, and, and use sustainable energy resources? No, less and less. Less and less. You know, again, it was the game uh, in, in Europe a long time ago, but people are not ready to pay a lot. And, uh, um, and at the end of the day, we have to be competitive. But as I said, we are competitive. You know, I'm going to give you a few examples. We are developing a lot in India. In India, it started with... Uh, tenders that were dedicated to renewable energy and to solar in particular. And it was dedicated to solar because people thought this way. You know, it's going to be more expensive, so we have to pay more, so it has to be a competition among solar players. And so we won some of, the, uh, of those tenders at the beginning where it was solar only. And then the Indian said, but what if we try to have an all fuel, whatever source, tender? And what it came is that we, as solar developers, we are competing against thermal developers, whether it's gas or coal or anyone, and we won. And at the end of the day, it was a portion of the, of the, the tender was more for thermal, a portion of the tender was more for solar, and we won everything. So at the end of the day, solar beat uh, the, uh, the, the thermal energy in, uh, in, in India. And that's what's happening for example, today in Argentina. In Argentina, we are selling electricity with our wind farms at a price that is significantly lower than that whatever alternatives that they have. And we are doing so, the same so thing. So the economics Europe. have changed. Exactly. And again, why? Because we try to capture the wind at a higher uh, altitude. So the, the turbines have not dramatically changed, but they are bigger. So they capture more wind and at an altitude where the wind speed is higher. So I'm not going to talk about technical aspects, but the fact is that with the same megawatts, we can generate twice or 2.5 times the same quantity of electricity. So it means that at the end of the day, the, the cost of this electricity has gone down dramatically. And if you talk, you see, you talk about solar, I'm just going to give you two numbers. Over the last 10 years, what happened is the solar industry moved from 2,000 megawatts installed in the world to 400,000 megawatts installed in the world. And the cost of solar went down by 90%. So you see what was... Nine zero. Nine zero. So what was highly subsidized when we started solar, and I remember my first roadshow when I was going to see investors and I was telling them, we have to do solar. And the guy told me, but solar is for the watch. You know, you remember the small yeah, panel yeah. that went on the watch? So they said, but this is for the watch. And I said, no, solar is going to be larger than wind. So today, solar can beat everything, you know, in countries like Chile, in countries like, in countries like India, in countries like Australia. We beat everyone with solar. And with wind, you know, same thing in, uh, in, uh, in Argentina. And, you know, it will be the same thing in Ukraine. So, Carl. You are one of Ukraine's preeminent entrepreneurs. You came to the country pretty much when I did, so we're, we're, we're veterans, 20, 20 more, more than 25 years ago. You created one of the most successful food processing companies in the region, uh, and then you've ne you're now doing wind. Listening to David, did you miss a trick? Should, we, should you have been doing solar? Actually, your neighbors, as I understand, too. Like, you're like, plots are right we're, next we're to each other. So, so what's, what's going to happen? You're not going to, like, undermine him, right? I mean, you're going to, like, support him now. No, we're we actually neighbors on three sides. So that, that's correct. And uh, the reason we switched from, from uh, food industry to, to wind was because we're living, in, well, we're operating in the Kherson region, and we realized that the wind is very good. 
And when the legislation came Kherson through. Kherson being southern, U southern Ukraine. Yeah, neighboring to, to the occupied territory of Crimea. So uh, when we realized that A, the wind is very good, B, we had a uh, new legislation which was came in 2009. The legislation which came in 2009, to my opinion, was actually uh, to a large extent a very good legislation. It was one mistake and that was an outrageous tariff on, on solar power that uh, I think Michael can confirm with the prices down 90% and the tariff being uh, four times higher than the tariff on wind. That, that was the only little problem in that legislation. Everything else, I do think the legislation that, that was it came in 2009 has done a fairly good effect on the, on the Ukrainian market. Now it's time to change that. I think the incentive period was there, and the incentive period has given its, its, its fruits. Uh, there are projects up and running, and, and now I think Ukraine can take the next step. Uh, two things uh, which I completely agree with Michael is that, that and also with Mr. Kopash is that uh, first, yes, there is, there is a climate crisis. Uh, B, good news, yes, th there is definitely technology today in place that can replace uh, traditional energy, right? So, so it now it's just a matter of getting it done, and that is extremely important to, to get the right legislation. Legislation where um, uh, the rep organization that Mr. Kopas represents has tremendous positive and negative experience, because the European Union countries, we have a lot of good examples, and we have a lot of very bad examples. We have a lot of examples, uh, examples where the tariffs were far too high and they had to uh, uh, retroactive change these tariffs and, and change the legislation, which has been a very, very difficult and, and messy trip for many European Union countries. Thank God that, that Ukraine can today take benefit of those learning points that are accumulated in the European Union and, and in the Energy Commission and also taking, taking grants, uh, well, taking benefit of the, of the very large development in, in uh, technologies that have come over the last 10 years. Uh, what you can say is, as a resume, Ukraine has, a, well, what you, could, what you could do is that if you would actually burn less than one ton of biomass per hectare of agricultural land in Ukraine, you could uh, take away all imported gas. You would replace more than 20 billion cubic meters of gas by burning less than one ton of biomass per hectare. So there is a solution there already. You know, you can actually just by, by doing that, that you, you would have Ukraine becoming energy independent. We do, we do know that Ukraine's uh, well, energy situation since independence has, has been uh, infected, affected by, by the very large wish of the Russian Federation not having Ukraine being energy independent. And Russia has been very efficient in, uh, in having, uh, well, its, its finger into the pot in, in the Ukrainian uh, energy situation, and until today, unfortunately, have succeeded, right? Ukraine is still very energy dependent, right? But the solution for that, as Michael said, it is very much there. And what do we need for that? We need to have, uh, to, uh, I don't believe in this happening by itself. I believe in those changes very much being kicked off by, by or catalyzed by good legislation. Ukraine needs good legislation. You need, Ukraine needs, uh, needs good uh, incentives. What, what do you think of the new auction law? I think the new auction law is good. Uh, I think, I think it's going to work fine. And, and uh, Michael just confirmed with his numbers that, that we will I be... I think you're referring to David. David, sorry. Uh, yes, sorry, David. Sorry. Well, we are the ones that <laughs> yeah. sponsored most sorry, of the David, legislation. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, David, but it applies to Michael as well. <laughs> David, what, what you just said... <laughs> next, Mike. I'm sorry, David. So, so what you just said is that, that, that uh, we can compete, right? So, so the auction is, is not scaring us off. We can compete with oil and gas. The question is just to have the legislation in place. Uh, in the end of the day, to burn oil and gas or burning fossil fuels, mm. if you have all the, the biomass in the fields in Ukraine, it's criminal. Because we know there's, there, are sectors, uh, there are sectors in the world which are dependent on natural gas. You have the whole chemical sector that cannot c exist without, uh, without natural gas, right? So the natural gas should be preserved for the industries where you need natural gas. The oil has to be preserved for the industries which can pro process oil into something else than, than just burning it, right? And that's why a country like Ukraine, of course, it is, it's purely criminal to bur burn oil and gas, to my mind. Uh, and another important thing is that 50% uh, of electricity in Ukraine is coming from nuclear power. 
And the nuclear power uh, has literally, since Ukraine became independent in 91, has not have had any uh, capital construction or any money really invested in uh, updating those nuclear power plants. And the lifespan of those nuclear power plants has been prolonged and prolonged and prolonged. Now I think the latest date is that 2030 or 20, I think Mr. Timshenka would know, 2035, 32, so 2032 is the lifespan of the last nuclear power reactor running out. And that is in 13 years, and 13 years is not such a long time. If we make a real calculation of the self-cost of nuclear power, the only, I think, under construction, there's one uh, nuclear power plant under construction in Great Britain, and the price in, the, in, that, uh, in that business case for the construction of that, I think the price is 15 uh, pence, uh, f which is then the real cost of newly built nuclear uh, power. And 15 pence, if we can get if we can get 30% uh, discount on that, we're more than happy, right? So, so yes, we can compete with nuclear power today, newly built. Ukraine's nuclear power cannot be prolonged forever uh, because nothing has been done in 27 years, and there's less than 50, 13 years left. Yeah. Well, you've raised you've raised a number of uh, interesting issues, and I think that we need to sort of draw into the Ukrainian energy strategy to 2035, which uh, sets as a goal. Uh, not less than 25% of Ukraine's energy mix being uh, coming from renewables. Uh, to 2020, it's supposed to be 11, and we're at about 1.8% right now. So, uh, you know, we are going to be highly unlikely going to make those uh, targets, especially with the, uh, at least the 2020 one, especially with the reduction uh, in the tariff uh, coming from the auctions. So we're, we're going to have to in really increase that with, uh, with volume. And Michael, did uh, uh, you can come back in this in, in, in a second, uh, mm -hmm. Carl. Um, uh, Michael, in terms of uh, one of the things that, that Carl has already uh, uh, that raised as well is that as part of this energy mix that we need to, aside from legislation that is essentially regulatory and that does create a market, and I think that it's consistent with what Janusz has said, that uh, it, this is where uh, the compliant with what is happening in, in the wider uh, European community. Um, but the issue is how do we use our agricultural potential? Not even potential. I mean, we're an agricultural powerhouse today. Uh, we were the uh, breadbasket of Europe in the past and we're now the food basket of, of, of the world. And, you know, you, you can discuss the criminality of leaving uh, biomass in the field, but essentially it's being used by the farmers as fertilizer. Um, not for any criminal intent, I hope, but uh, uh, the the question and the justifiable uh, point that you raise is, is that really the most effective use for that potential source of, of energy? And you've chosen uh, solar as well as, uh, as a place that you're, uh, where you've started uh, your first major Canadian investment uh, in, uh, in the energy sector in, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, how do you see this rolling out, Michael? And are you going to stick with solar, or does, does this, uh, some of these al alternate fuels also hold, uh, hold promise? What's, uh, what's, what's the strategy? Sure, thanks. So for us, we see natural synergies between oil and gas design and capital investment and solar power. Uh, wind is also coming up the curve. But for us, based upon the needs of the Ukrainian economy, uh, the payback ratio and the fixed cost uh, return on investment to shareholders, solar is one of the greatest things you can do irrespective of the feed-in tariff regime. Uh, the key, I guess, the three elevator pitches are number one, uh, solar PV efficiencies have doubled. Um, it's very well known that the Moore's Law is well in effect for PV efficiencies. So do you use the same computer you did in 1993 in the year 2018? Absolutely not. Total, British Petroleum, Exxon Mobil, all have a renewable strategy. Uh, Beyond Petroleum was about 20 years too early. Yeah, David's it. He is, he, he is the validation that Canadian entrepreneurism and the ability to transition your core, your core competencies from oil and gas into renewables is the way of the future. And for us, going to a country like Ukraine, where you have the largest land mass outside of, you know, the free, the free breadbasket of America, some of the best solar radiation and wind conditions on the, on the continent, um, it's a bright future. And if you look at countries like France, countries like Germany, they need like seven gigawatts to balance their grid by 2030. And Ukraine is the destination for investment. 
Um, in 2015, Carl was the only guy in the industry um, that you know foreign direct banks could hang their hat on, other than DTEC, uh, you know, a very large integrated power company as well. And we now, in the year 2018, we've got multinationals coming into the industry that are seeing this as a core area of capital investment. And for us, we believe that staying on the right track here, continuing to build out our large capital base, continuing to build a large footprint that institutional investors can see as the core demographic growth area for the world economy is the right track. That's, that's very interesting. La the last point you made, I mean, a lot of interesting points, but the last one you made, I want to come back to in a minute on institute, how do we attract institutional investment? Because uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that's going to be a key issue going forward. But one of the things that you need to do for institutional investors in my uh, experience is that you have to have the legislative and the regulatory regime in place that provides that certainty, stability, and long-term viability of the, uh, uh, of the sector. And uh, Janusz, in your uh, experience, uh, what in, in especially vis-a-vis -vis the, the work that you've been doing in Ukraine, how far has Ukraine actually gone now in integrating its, or the system that's on, on, the, on, the, on the dance card right now, how far is that going to go to integrating it into that European space that people are going to say, yes, we have, a sufficient degree of regulatory compliance. We have a uh, sufficient degree of regulatory convergence. You know, we get you know the changes that are happening in the area of the rule of law. We see the stability. We see you have people like Mr. Dombrowski and, and and others in the parliament who can not just talk the talk but walk the walk um, and and get things done. How how what are we still what have we done and what do we still have to do? First. Uh, so <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, we are talking about electricity mostly now in, in this panel. Um, uh, Ukraine has um, uh, kind of a barrier because it's not synchronized with uh, central or continental European electricity system. It's still uh, synchronized with Russian um, electricity system. And this is a physical border between Ukraine and the West. Uh, among uh, uh, there is a, a western part of Ukraine which is called Burstyn Island, close to uh, um, Lviv, um, which is synchronized. But this is the only one. Uh, all the rest is synchronized with with Russian one. Uh, Ukraine uh, Ukrainian transmission system operator Ukrenergo signed a contract with uh, European Association of Transmission System Operators with a plan to synchronize with the rest of Europe. Um, and this plan should be fulfilled in five years, but uh, I mean, very many organizational... And Another five-year plan. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, many, many things have to be done uh, to, to make this really happen. Um, this will bring benefit of being part of really internal energy market. But currently, Ukraine, I mean, Ukraine as, as itself is also a huge market if you talk about electricity, and it has a possibility to import electricity, I don't know, from Belarus, for example, um, fr from Russia, but this is politically sensitive. Um, so there is a possibility to establish a real functioning electricity trade also being not being synchronized, and for this, of course, you need proper legislation. Ukraine is opening its electricity market on 1st of July this year. This is envisaged in the electricity market law. Not entirely, but major steps should be done. Hopefully, all these political turmoils uh, will, will, uh, this year, so two elections, uh, will not postpone uh, this reform uh, once again, as it happened in the past. But uh, let's say that we are close. Uh, second thing uh, which is important is to establish an uh, independent regulator. And this Ukraine last year really succeeded. Um, uh, and this uh, independent uh, regulator, energy regulator is offering a firm, um, predictable market environment. Um, but of course, there are many problems, some of them tiny, some of them bigger, uh, which still need to be overcome. Just to illustrate one, for example, uh, everybody is, is uh, upset, uh, traders, industry, transmission system operator, but ministry at this moment still prohibits import electricity from European Union, so from Slovakia uh, or Hungary, for example, into this Burstyn Island where it could be imported uh, because physical connection exists uh, and so on. But we will overcome this, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, 
Um, these are only provisional, uh, I would say, interest-driven uh, decisions, um, which will perhaps after elections be much easier, hopefully. Um, and uh, in general, the, the legal framework is there. Um, and uh, some secondary legislation is still needed, but implementation in practice is still um, uh, lacking. Um, but it, it's going on. I'm optimistic. Um, and second thing, we are all talking about renewables or only renewables today when talking about climate crisis. Um, we are in the era of not only a climate crisis, we are in era of decarbonization. So this is, this is the, the reason for climate crisis. And era of decarbonization has two elements. One is renewables, and I, I believe back in, uh, that in 2050, 2060, the whole, perhaps not India yet, but otherwise more developed part of the world, including Ukraine, will mostly run on electricity only, um, not, not fo no fossil fuels. Um, but uh, the, the, the other part is energy efficiency. And energy efficiency is still not on its dynamics. I mean, in renewables, many things happened. There were investments, uh, business models are established, but energy efficiency is still lacking behind. And th there, this is something where Ukraine still needs to do a lot because there will not be enough renewables for all energy consumption we will need in the future, uh, excluding nuclear and all fossil fuels. We will need to bring down the energy consumption. Just one illustration. If all the electricity appliances, which are now on standby, would be switched off, uh, the consumption of electricity would drop by 20%. So just imagine how uh, important is also technology development in energy efficiency. Uh, and uh, uh, the third part of legislative framework which I would like to touch is um, uh, environmental one. Ukraine asked in the energy community and it got uh, postponement of implementation deadline for large combustion plants directive. For some uh, plants up till 2030 what is a long time, because all the other um, energy community members have to implement large combustion plants uh, directive already now. Uh, and this gave Ukraine, which was at that time in the uh, status of a war, and everybody understood, uh, so electricity is first, environment is second at that time. Uh, this gave Ukraine additional transitional period, uh, which is from now on, let's say, 10 years. And in these 10 years, Ukraine doesn't have the emissions trading, so CO2 emissions do not cost anything, and it doesn't have um, an obligation to respect large combustion plants directive, so it means lowering emissions of NOx of, and other um, poisonous gases and uh, part uh, particulates. Um, so, uh, dust. Um, Ukraine got in legal framework additional, let's say, 10, 12 years uh, transitional period, uh, which of course has to use for something uh, uh, future oriented, not to spend these extra profits, which energy industry got in that time, for uh, further cross subsidization and uh, maintaining- do, do you see that they're dragging their feet or do you see that this, that, that this is being used uh, effectively as uh, this period of, uh, this grace period? No, uh, I, I think, I mean, uh, currently uh, the, the actors should be the same. So the, the profit collectors should be investors into uh, into the future, not- We're still in a transition type of, yeah. a, of, of a period. Yeah. This, uh, this is what I'm saying, we shall not now invest into the past, so to keep everything non-reformed, we shall invest into the future. And this is renewables, energy efficiency. Dan, if I can just piggyback sure. onto that, we completely agree. In Canada, one of the core competencies of the oil and gas industry, Total and Suncor have been visionary leaders, as has Termaline, our family company, but reinvesting economic profits into trigger industries, 
one of the big things to come out of a deregulated power sector in Canada, which a lot of these laws were based on, was the fact that you can now have commercial contracts and you can start to have ESG standards being adopted in the manufacturing industry. And, you know, since we did the renewable power law and the electricity market laws that the European Union worked on with Canada, we've seen a lot of manufacturing companies, that whole manufacturing 4.0, come to Ukraine. And so if you talk to the bankers, the hedge funds, all the buy sides that made all their returns over the last two years in Ukraine, one of the big catalysts has been in the Ukrainian narrative of why Ukraine and why now it's because of these market reforms and the ability to make commercial electricity contracts with big manufacturing companies like Toyota, like Mitsubishi, and big companies like IKEA now are feeling comfortable coming into the Ukrainian market because they can operate just like they would in Montana or Ohio in downtown Ukraine. I mean, is that, was that, a, is that a pretty accurate uh, description for you? I mean, what are you doing in Ukraine? You're at, you're at, you got 1.3 uh, gigawatts around the world. Uh, what's, what's the we are just starting in Ukraine, but I would like to come back on two things. Uh, one, the energy efficiency, and two, the, uh, the auctions. I fully agree with you. We have to work on energy efficiency, but it's a very complicated uh, situation. And I think that the solutions will come from a number of, uh, of, um, of aspects. The first one is going to be technology. The world is going to change completely. We'll have electric vehicles everywhere. So the consumption of electricity is going to increase dramatically. Uh, but also the digitalization of the, of the industry and the digi digitalization of the economy is going to make that the technology will help us dramatically as well on this issue of energy efficiency. So I'm not saying we should not do it, but what I'm saying is that the solutions will come from one, the new technologies, and two, the new usage of electricity. But we'll use a lot of electricity. The, the second aspect is I think it's going to come we have to do it fast, but it's going to come with the new generations. I think for, for you, the political decision makers in this room, I think that energy is some e efficiency is something that we should teach uh, in schools. Because the issue is that with the adults, it's almost too late. You know, people don't take, uh, don't, 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 you know, don't switch off completely the television and, uh, and they leave it. So the regulation is going to be important. The technology is going to be important. The education is going to be very important. So that's the first comment I wanted to make on energy efficiency. The second thing is you are trying to oppose more or less wind and solar. You should not. You know, we don't, I we was don't just mind. being provocative. Uh, okay, I know. I saw that. So I think that, you know, both of them are good. You know, you have to see what is the resource that you have in your country. If you have very good wind, good for you. If you have very good sun, good for you. If you have both, then you should develop both. And on top of it, the, the, the main issue, because there is one big issue with renewable energy, is the intermittency of the production. You don't generate electricity when people need electricity. You generate electricity when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. So, and that's an issue. The good news with wind and solar is that they don't have the same production profile. So you compensate a portion, a big portion of the intermittency of the production by having both. So if you have both, good for you. If you have only one, develop this one. The second aspect on this one is that even intermittency will not be an issue. You know, what has happened, and I was describing in the 90s of the technology on wind and solar is happening now with storage. The cost of storage of electricity is reducing dramatically. We are putting batteries in a lot of countries. For the time being, some people are making the effort, make, meaning paying subsidies or overpaying for this electricity. So I'm not sure that you know, all countries have to do it. Some rich countries are doing it, or some industrial countries are doing it just to create their industry in this uh, battery storage. But the storage is going to come. The cost is going to be significantly lower and solar and wind electricity storage, with storage, meaning that we can deliver electricity when you need and not when we have wind, is going to be cheaper than anything in 10 years. So that's the, the, the second comment. Sorry, I want to make one, one comment Absolutely. on the auction. Because and I'm not trying to tell you what you should do and should not do. I'm just going to tell you what happened in the past because we have been in this business for 20 years. And I've seen some, exa for example, just the dif difference in development between France and Germany on one side and the UK on the other side. 
France and Germany decided to go with a feed-in tariff. Fixed price, no risk, take or pay, you provide your electricity, you are paid, whatever happens, for 20 years at the same price, or for 50, 15 years at the same price. In the UK, they decided to do it differently. It's the country of the market. So they said, no, you are going to sell your electricity on the market at the spot price. But it's not sufficient. So we'll give you a green certificate. It's not called like this, but anyway, it's a rock. So we'll give you a rock. And, but the rock is going to be sold on the market. So you have to make your own assumption of what is going to be the price of electricity, what is going to be the price of the green certificate. At the end of the day, the UK paid much more for the green electricity than France and Germany. That's it. So we are in an in in industry, whether it's wind and solar, which is highly capital intensive. Our job is to find the best locations, to build the projects, to find the financing of the project, which is complicated because it's always a lot of money. But once we put our installation on the ground, as I say, usually when we put our money on the ground, what do you want to do? You know, the wind is going to come, you know, the operating costs are very low, it's going to be blowing. We don't pay for the wind, we don't pay for the sun, it comes for free. But the big issue is our investment. We made a big investment. So a country has two solutions. One solution is to play. And one solution is to reduce the cost. To play, you go and you say, you know what? You are going to take some risks. What kind of risks? For example, if the grid is not available, we are curtail you, and we don't have to pay you. So if we cannot take your electricity, too bad for you. Yes, it's a take or pay, but it's too bad for you. OK, so that's one risk. The other risk is to say, OK, you know, we are not going to adjust the tariff. We are not going to have a fixed tariff, but we play only for 10 years or for five years, and then you go to the spot market. I'm going to tell you, every time that a country has decided to put risks on the wind operators that are not a risk that a wind operator or a solar operator can manage, they pay more for the electricity. That's it. So ever you say that, yes, you make the contractual structure, the regulatory framework with low risk and then you get the good price or you don't make it low risk and you will pay because of the risk. And the last thing, and I will shut up, uh, is on the way to organize the auction. I've seen many auctions with what we call the liars. So if in an auction you come and there is not a big penalty if you don't build in a short time frame, then you have all the people coming from the world putting a price, getting the option, but it's an option. They are not necessarily going to build. You don't know as a country whether you will get your wind farms, your wind electricity or not. You have just the people coming and saying, okay, it costs me just to put an envelope. So I'm gonna put an envelope or I'm gonna play on the computer. I put the price, if I build good for me, if I don't build, I don't lose anything, and maybe I'm going to sell the project to somebody else. And I've seen so many countries where the people bid at a stupid price, and they come to me after that and say, do you want to build this person? And no, I don't want at your price because I stopped the auction before. So, so that's why I'm saying, you know, the auction is something which is, looks good, but it's much more complicated than to have to write feed in tariff. Okay, and uh, I, I want to get uh, Janis, you wanted to come in, and then I want Carl to, uh, to come in and have a specific question. And then we, have, uh, we have actually have some legislators uh, in, the, in the audience and, uh, uh, who I'm sure would, uh, would like to comment on this, and I see a lot of other energy experts uh, and, uh, and business people, so we'll open it up for some questions. Janis, very, okay. briefly, very briefly. Just about feeding tariff. Uh, feeding tariff is good to start or to, to yeah. develop the market. Uh, but then once it becomes too expensive uh, and dramatical drop of technology costs uh, allowed uh, and of course also development of expertise in how to design proper auctions allowed to have very uh, successful auctions now. Uh, perhaps it wouldn't be possible some years ago. Uh, just to give you an example, for example, Albania, which is not a case of best practice in new market developments, uh, recently had an auction for photovoltaics um, and uh, they auctioned feed-in tariff. So who, who requests less? Very simple. Uh, and uh, there was a, a winning um, consortium, Indian Hong Kong, uh, won the, the auction and uh, 
they uh, they started with auction on hu with hundred euros per megawatt hour and they ended with 59 um, and it was done through let's say half an hour of auctioning so uh, it functions uh, perhaps with even better design we could or they could come to I don't know 55 or something like this and then perhaps this would already be too risky but when we talk about risks, the biggest risk is risk of uh, is is high capital cost, and it's a political risk of a country. Is uh, uh, especially if we talk about wind, is the biggest uh, cost producer. Uh, photovoltaics is uh, easier, uh, and uh, this is a problem also in European Union, where, for example, Greece has three, four times higher political risk than Germany, and this is why a wind turbine in Greece is twice as expensive as it is in Germany. Uh, uh, the same technology. Uh, and this is something where Ukraine as a state still needs to... Uh, so this, this issue of risk allocation is, uh, seems to be very fundamental and uh, clearly it will weigh on the minds of, of institutional investors and, and others. I mean, if you have this kind of consideration going on inside the European Union, mm -hmm. for countries that are outside the European Union, it's probably even more. Carl, what does that mean for your business in terms of the risk allocation? How do you, you've heard the two debates. Well, well, how do, well how, what's I, this I going think, to do? I think that, your that business model? Um, uh, of course, uh, the, 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 big, the big question for Ukraine's renewable sector is how to finance it, right? And we've been speaking about energy efficiency, and we spoke, uh, had a lot of comments about energy efficiency, and I, I thought we forgot about the most important. What is the best way to have a country working for energy efficiency? To my mind, that is have a market price of the electricity. And if you have a market price and dereg deregulated market, you have a real market price, then people are going to have to pay much more. And that's a very good motivator to, to, go to run for energy efficiency. We've seen it with the gas. With <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we saw that in the gas sector the last year, the gas consumption for households is down to half in Ukraine because people cannot afford to buy gas for heating their houses. So raising the ga gas prices worked very well for energy efficiency. Uh, when it comes to that fact, how do you look at Ukraine's energy efficiency over 27 years of independence? First, Ukraine lived for 23 years, uh, giving up energy efficiency and independence by getting cheap gas from Russia. Uh, if we go back to 2013, more than 10% of GDP in Ukraine was uh, subsidies to the state oil and gas company and subsidies going into the coal sector. More than 10% of GDP in 2013. So this is a very good way of driving not energy efficiency, right? Where you're subsidizing uh, gas and, and electricity consumption year after year after year in combination with uh, just eating up the, the, the amortization years of the, of the nuclear power sector, which means that Ukraine never ever had close to the real price for electricity for industry or for the consumers. So that's a very good way of starting for energy efficiency. Second, where you're, gonna, where, where, where you're driving that, in, in, if you start doing that the right way, you will take away a lot of legislation, you will take away a lot of state regulation of the, of the industry, and that is exactly what the financial institutions like. Because big banks and big financial institutions, they don't like to invest into a market which is heavily regulated, heavily uh, dependent on legislation, laws, functioning, not functioning, and so on. So, so deregulation, uh, smart legislation would drive A, energy efficiency, B, would actually be make it more attractive for financial institutions to come to Ukraine. And here we come to the most important question. Unfortunately, this is a fact, that before the war that started in early 2014, Ukrainian businesses were, mu it was much easier for Ukrainian companies to get uh, export credit agencies to finance produce in Ukraine than today. Meaning that the previous president and the big businesses of those days had an easier time to ob obtain export finance from European Union countries than today, four years, five years after the war started. Uh, and this is, of course, a big responsibility for European Union is that, yes, political <coughs> support for Ukraine, fantastic. But it would also be good because there's a good saying that, you know, the, the, the surgery went well, but the patient died, right? So if you continue speaking about energy efficiency, but there is no financial institutions coming to Ukraine being able to support those countries. Especially kind of since we're trending in the, in the right direction with the regulatory compliance, et cetera. So people should be feeling, the company so should be feeling more comfortable. So I believe in the liberalization of legislation. 
real market price because the banks would understand that this electricity price is not going to be paid by some, some tricky law which has to be approved by four ministries and then maybe we're going to get paid in the end of the day, right? No, it's going to be paid by the consumers. Right. So it's actually real consumers who's going to pay, pay back the credit in the end of the day. But to be uh, here, fair, yeah. to be fair, um, the big thing that panel members as well as the institutional markets that are looking at Ukraine in Davos this week need to recognize is that this is an incredible opportunity. And 90% of the debt capital markets know about Ukraine because one of the most successful bond trades in the last 250 years was the bailout of Ukraine and the Natalie Juresko PIK bonds, the coupons. In addition, one of the most successful capital efficiency stories in Ukraine is the renewable power industry. Getting that message out to the FDI banks, like French Development Bank, EBRD, the British Development Bank, that is something that is very unique that you're hearing here for the first time in five years. Russia House, the main mainstream media, it's all about why Ukraine is failing, why none of the economy is working, why the credit markets are failing, why debt capital institutions are failing. As an asset manager who came to this country, an asset manager as big as some of the main hedge funds you see on the stage, like 70.72, there were a lot of mainstream hedge funds that made their best returns in 2015, 2016, and 2017 betting on the Ukrainian stock market. The Ukrainian stock market last year was the best performing in the world for the last two years. You don't hear about that at the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal, but you're hearing about it here. And guys like Klaus, guys like Total, Carl, me, Carl sorry, I'm tired, don't judge me. Um, that is a story that sorry, needs man. to be shared with your friends and peers, that Ukraine is open for business, that credit conditions exist, that real companies are changing the world, building power pools that are going to be powering Europe for the next three decades. That's a, I just that's want a, to say, you know, just to be fair, because what I an wanted enthusiastic to enthusiastic yeah. panel. I no, can't control them. No, I'm no, no, because on panel. financial institutions, I just want to be fair to the people at EBRD. You know, we will, we will be signing tonight. So, and I tell you, they, they have been extremely supportive of the project that we are developing in Ukraine because it is in Ukraine. So the, the financial institutions are coming. Well, if it wasn't for Ukraine, EBRD has no right to exist. Because yeah. EBRD is the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, and they were supposed to support pro projects in transforming countries in Central Europe that now are all part of the European Union, and left this Russia, which they cannot finance, Turkey and Ukraine. So if it wasn't for Ukraine, then EBRD should close the shop and go home. Uh, uh, we are doing a lot of other things yeah. with EBRD. Okay, let's, let's get a few uh, uh, co comments or very, very brief questions. Paul Grodd, who's in the energy sector, aside from being an all-around nice guy and head of the World Congress of Ukrainians. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Paul Grad. I'm the uh, CEO of Rodan Energy. We're an energy management company, a smart grid integrator uh, based in North America. I, I want to say one thing, and I just want to reemphasize and reiterate what, what Michael said in terms of the, the positivism. Uh, uh, our company only today uh, is now seriously looking at investing in Ukraine. Uh, seriously looking at this electricity market because of the reforms that were made, and that has to be credited because that's, that's an important recognition uh, that in the past wasn't there. Uh, my question really comes down to what I would consider a day of reckoning. We've seen this in other markets that we've been active in, whether it's in, in Europe or in, or in North America, where there's a disconnect between what the consumer is paying for power and what uh, the price is being paid for the green tariff. And often this catches up to, uh, to, to governments, especially when you're dealing with uh, a wave of populist governments who turn around and say, we can no longer continue to finance because there's such a, a big discrepancy between the cost of uh, what the consumers pay and what we're paying power producers. How do you deal with that in terms of, because that I think is a, 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 an issue that we often hear from investors in any market, is when you see that great disconnect, there is a, a re, a, 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 an issue of where does the difference get paid? And who, and who bears that cost? So okay, let's, I'm going to take a couple of questions uh, in a row and then we can package them together. Uh, Natalia, you wanted to, uh, to say something. 
And Natalia Kaczybuczkowska is a, a people's deputy, uh, our parliamentary. Well, 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 thank you, actually. I'm also working since uh, 2014 on energy reform, especially we uh, put a lot of efforts uh, to change uh, renewables legislation as we not only see this as an investment field, but also as a part of uh, um, energy security agenda of Ukraine, as we actually need to change from one source of supply for, for energy to diversify and and renewables are a big part of it. Uh, so I suppose it's very important, as we are, uh, we are talking about, in 2014, we opened this market for foreign investors as it was closed before and ke kept in few hands. Uh, uh, we changed uh, feed-in tariff, we support renewables investors, and now we are thinking how to continue. Because Ukraine has obligation to reach 11% renewables uh, before European Union, according to association agreement. We also signed the uh, COPE agreement and and we also very devoted to our sustainability agenda, as well as we want to attract more investment in our green economy. Uh, so now the key issue, how to transform from feeding tariff to auction system, which would be implemented in recent years, and how to make this transition period wise and uh, enough to transfer, transfer it to this system and to companies who already invested uh, wise. So at this point, I would like to ask questions what do you think about this transition period? How many years uh, it should be to turn from feeding tariff to auction system? Your suggestions, your experience, you are, came from different countries. Uh, it would be good for us to know as now we are at the stage when we are developing and we are still designing new legislation. Thank you very much. Last question. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Jim Brook, Ukraine Business News. This is more for Mr. Torchia. Uh, you mentioned that the new frontier is battery storage. As you may know, Ukraine has the wor Europe's largest lithium deposits, which is the essential ingredient for modern batteries. Have you heard of concrete plans to build uh, battery plants in Ukraine? Have you heard of any developments along those lines? Okay. So we've got a Paul's question on the cost discrepancy, um, the issue of how long do we think this transition period should, uh, should last and what do we need to, to speed it up, and the issue of uh, moving into, and I, somebody touched on it, I think it was David, digitization, batteries, the, what, 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 what's coming next? Uh, perhaps. Uh, Very briefly. Yeah, uh, perhaps I'll try to answer on first two questions. Um, uh, new renewables law or renewable support law hopefully it will be adopted now in, let's say, March, uh, shall introduce auctions. First, auctions could be organized uh, by the end of this year, uh, following the new system. Uh, EBRD, here I have to somehow uh, talk very nice about them. <laughs> uh, uh, they offer technical assistance to, to develop uh, the system of auctions. And uh, recently, when again answering on this question uh, about discrepancy, uh, Harry Boyd Tem Carpenter, a uh, um, senior official of EBRD, recently in, in Kiev said, there is no dilemma, I, I mean, uh, uh, between feeding tariff and uh, investments in renewables uh, or auctions and investments in renewables. There will be no investments if you will keep continu uh, continue with the feeding tariff because it is so high uh, that nobody trusts. Um, and uh, the problem is that it is uh, carved in a stone, in a law, uh, which is impossible to change, and the only way to change it is to introduce auctions. So uh, legal environment hopefully will be settled. First auctions could be organized by the end of this year. So anybody else want to comment on those? You want to address the, the battery? Uh no, I'm, the I'm sorry, I'm not aware about any project of, build, of uh, manufacturing batteries in Ukraine. Um, the issue today for battery manufacturing industry is that you have two very, very big players, uh, South Korea and, and China, who have decided strategically to invest significantly in this business. And they are building factories that are extremely large and it's going to be very difficult to compete against these guys. So, so I, I would not say it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a bad idea, but it's something that the country as a whole has to take very seriously because it costs to subsidize these industries if you want them to develop, and then you should not stop because 
the wind experience in Germany made, or the solar experience in Germany made that they had a huge industry and now the industry has completely disappeared. Do you want to address Paul's uh, question? Uh, I was actually trying to answer uh, Natalia's question about the transition period, right? And, and I have to say that, that I'm sitting between two gentlemen who are speaking about the auction here, right? And I do understand, I think the, the, the current legislation is regulating the transition time. So I think that that's part of the, of the legislation that's right now under approval, correct? I think the transition period is like till 1st of January 2020. Yeah. Okay. So, but I think it, it, there, there, there is a quite close understanding that that law that is now uh, past the first hearing yeah. is, is going to the second hearing. Isn't, isn't that correct? Because, because I, I, I have to say that I, I completely agree with David is that auction is a wonderful word, right? And, but the, the auction is just one simple word and there are like hundred different ways of doing this. And some ways have been very successful, some ways have been a disaster. Yep. Uh, Turkey is a disaster. I mean, two years ago they went to auctions, all the products in Turkey have been picked up by, by people very close to the, to the president of Turkey, and, and everybody stopped building. So Turkey is basically not building the, or the biggest auction of one gigawatt on solar, and the big, big uh, one gigawatt of wind, uh, that were all taken by one big player. Uh, they, they have not built one zero uh, installation in, in, in the last three years. So Mr. Dombrowski, the first session of your committee in parliament is to discuss what an auction means. <laughs> yeah, because it's very Where's difficult, you know. No, because very because happy auction is beautiful. It's, yeah. It yeah, sounds yeah, no, nice. It understood. sounds nice, gotta, but, but, it, but it can be a Michael, mess. Last yeah. word. No. Sure, thank you. So the key message today is that Ukraine is open for business. Against all odds, this is a country that has survived a war, a system failure of its banking sector, capital devaluation, and still, despite all those odds, which most countries would implode under, we have seen a renewable industry thrive, double in size, attract foreign direct investment, and multinational companies. That is something that you can take to the bank. The second key issue here is that this is a country using the best practices of the world. It's using the best legislation, it's using the best institutional knowledge, and it's building a framework that works for investors. I'm a case study of it as a Canadian institutional investor. Total is an institutional investor. Windcraft is a family office, one of the most prestigious ones in his country. The message here is that transition and stability is going to create a good economy we're going to power this country, and it is going to become one of the great industrial renaissances that people need to get on the, in on the ground floor. If you sound you like China, me, but it's much more credible coming from abso you. Absolutely. Much more I'm, credible coming I'm from you. I'm bought me. in. I'm bought in. But here's the thing. In 1982... Want my job? Absolutely. In 1982, guys, nobody believed China was going to be a world superpower. They had a famine. They were dealing with the Vietnamese crisis of refugees. They were dealing with the technical assistance failures of the Soviet Union trying to cut them off. And yet the one market call was when Henry Kissinger and Justin Trudeau's father went to China with the Power Corporation. The big market call that they made was that in the next decade, the Chinese people would consume more power per person than any other country on the planet. Fast forward to the year 2018 and nobody is laughing at those companies that were on the ground floor in China in 1982. As a hedge fund, as an institutional investor into this country, sitting beside Wincraft and Total, my market call is that after the election, after the change in the feed-in tariff regime to a deregulated market based upon the European and the Alberta Deregulated Power Acts, you will see a country that will either be one of the greatest institutional market calls in the last decade, or you will see a country that will, against all odds, manage to pull through the global economy with the same GDP per capita and double the amount of consumer discretionary spending than you will find on the planet. And I will be here every year and I will stand beside Bilak if he keeps sitting in that chair, mm -hmm. and we will go year over year, and I guarantee you, this will be the story that you will be telling your kids about, hell or high water. Well, that, that's my wrap-up speech. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I'd like to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank the audience for a, a very engaging and, uh, and invigorating discussion, first thing in the morning. 
Uh, it's better than coffee. And, uh, you know, it just uh, there's not much left to say after, uh, after Michael's wrap-up, and, and thank you, Michael, for again, for sponsoring this panel, um, is that we have some challenges. I think that uh, we've, uh, th those have been uh, brought out today in, in, in reasonably uh, a clear format. But I think that really what we all need to take away from this is that in the renewable sector uh, and in energy sector in general, this was the single greatest energy in oil and gas in particular, was the single greatest area of corruption before 2014. Today, the market and that sector, all of these sectors have been completely transformed. Nafta gas was at one point 6%, represented 6% of Ukraine's GDP debt to GDP deficit. It's now a net contributor to the budget. And now we're not only, uh, it's not only a transparency issue, it's as uh, Carl pointed out, energy independence is a matter of national security. And the, what's happening in renewables, the laws that are being passed, the great work that Mr. Dombrowski's uh, uh, committee is doing in the parliament, uh, working with the government, with the president. I really believe that whatever, whoever becomes president and whatever the composition of parliament, these will remain constants because we have nowhere else to go. We made a civilizational choice and through the great work that, uh, that uh, Mr. Kopach and his organization has, has done, have guided us into a regulatory, and are continuing to guide us into a regulatory framework that everybody that invests in Ukraine will be able to understand. Thank you once again for your participation. Have a great day.